Let us take a look at the photoelectric effect. That's one of the two or three major topics from chapter 38. I believe it was Robert Millikan who first discovered this effect. That's the same guy that measured the charge to mass ratio of the electron by uh, messing around with those um, oil drops. No, that's not the charge to mass ratio experiment. That was the one that actually determined the fundamental unit of charge. Somebody had already measured the charge to mass ratio before. You can review the history in chapter 37. Just as, as we go along here, keep in mind that at the time this was discovered, electrons were a very new concept. So here's, here's the basic setup. You've got a glass tube from which the air has been evacuated as much as possible so that when light enters a window here, this is not open to the atmosphere, it's sealed. Light enters through the glass, strikes this cathode, which is just a fancy name for a piece of metal. Same thing with the anode. They're both just pieces of metal. They get their names from their respective roles in the circuit. You know, one is traditionally, traditionally thought of as the negative end of the circuit, and the other one's the, uh, the positive. They're both electrodes. And then there's a piece of wire closing the circuit. This is the symbol for a voltage source. So hopefully those of you who have taken 3B remember some of this stuff. Here's the symbol for a meter for measuring current. Simple as that. And it was discovered that if light was allowed to strike this metal, even if there were no voltage source here, all right, this, you could take this battery or whatever, just take it out and have a, a single piece of wire connecting or closing the circuit. A current, a measurable, measurable current is set up in this wire uh, because of the light striking the cathode here. And because of previous experiments with uh, the cathode ray tubes and the growing acceptance of the uh, existence of electrons, it was understood that there must be charge passing from here to here. And I think at this point, it was accepted that those were electrons. I don't think they were calling them electrons yet. Okay, so you're used to thinking of a closed circuit as requiring a, a voltage source, a battery, to get current to flow. Remember, even a wire has some resistance. There's no nominal resistor symbol drawn here, but even copper wires have some resistance, and you cannot force current to flow through a resistor without some sort of uh, motive force, as it used to be called. And in this case, it's, it's not a battery, so there's no, there's no uh, stored chemical energy in a cell that's being used to, to set up an electric field within the wire, the incoming light is evidently the source of the energy. So that's kind of interesting. And you know, the, the root photo refers to light and electricity, of course, is what's measured in the ammeter, ammeter hence the name photoelectric effect. And the photoelectric effect is fairly ubiquitous in modern technology. If you have a garage door at home and you've got one of those sensors that uh, you know, suppose as the garage door is closing, you try to walk under the door, you'll, you'll trip the circuit and it, the garage door will stop closing so it doesn't crush you, but it probably couldn't crush you, but so it doesn't injure you. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that there's two electrodes on opposite side of, of the door, opposite sides, and there's an infrared beam hitting one of the electrodes and causing a photoelectric current, which gets interrupted when your body blocks the beam. Same thing with the, uh, the grocery store sensors, I think. Y you could do some Googling, but there's all kinds of devices that use the photoelectric effect nowadays. Okay, so what we'll do is uh, just discuss the vocabulary here, the basic setup, and then we'll look at a simulation. Because if a picture is worth a thousand words, a Java simulation is worth a thousand pictures. This voltage source here is under our control. It can be adjusted in magnitude and polarity. Okay, here's a little silly picture, incoming light rays. These electrons belong to the cathode. The cathode is made out of metal. It could be any metal, but we know that the electrons are part of the metal, but they can be ejected by the incoming light. Okay, so uh, the electrons that, that were formerly, formerly part of the cathode, remember the cathode, that chunk of metal is electrically neutral. So if you remove electrons, let me grab the laser pointer. If you remove electrons, wouldn't you have just given this a, a positive charge perhaps? And if this has a positive charge, well, would that make this have a, 
a negative charge? I'd have to think about that. In any case, these ejected electrons will zip across the empty space between the electrodes where they will rejoin the charged particles in this electrode. And that's how the, uh, the current keeps flowing. So if you look at the net motion of electrons, it would have to be clockwise around the circuit. That's if you're illuminating this electrode with the, uh, the incoming light. If you were to illuminate this electrode instead, you'd have the electrons ejected the other way. They would rejoin here and presumably flow back around. And remember that, that uh, unfortunate consequence of the convention. When uh, Benjamin Franklin came up with these terms, positive and negative, he was not aware that the charge carriers were actually negative electrons. So electrons flowing clockwise around this circuit actually constitutes a counterclockwise conventional current. Like positive charge carriers flowing counterclockwise is equivalent to, well, for most purposes, equivalent to negative charges flowing clockwise. Okay, so down here I've actually indicated the polari polarity of the battery. So suppose that over here we're at a higher electric potential than we are on this side. So if this was a one and a half volt battery, this would be the one and a half potential side and the or one and a half volts potential side and the zero volts potential side. Those of you who have not taken 3B, uh, this may be confusing to you. So there's really a, a very close analogy between electric potential and gravitational potential energy. For the purposes of this discussion, you can imagine that this battery sets up the electric equivalent of a gravitational field. And the gravitational field points counterclockwise around the circuit. It goes from positive down to negative. So this is like downhill. When you drop a mass, from the top of a building and allow it to fall down towards the ground. That's like charge descending down through the electric field. Okay, and that's why I've chosen the direction of the green arrows here as such. E for electric field. The electric field points, uh, there's two ways of thinking about it. Well, more than two ways, but here are two ways. It points in the direction of decreasing potential energy, right? Just like gravity points down, that's the direction of decreasing potential energy. But it also points in the direction that positive charges would be pushed, okay? Positive charges would be pushed from here to there. They would be pushed from positive to negative. However, we're talking about electrons which have the opposite charge. So one thing you should know in order to solve these problems is that electrons get pushed opposite the electric field. And the formula that you would use is, is merely this. And this is directly analogous to an equation from 3A. Do you remember in 3A, if you know the mass of an object, all you have to do is take its mass and multiply by the strength of the gravitational field, mg, to get the force on the mass. So instead of 9.8 meters per second per second, you could describe the, the g field as newtons per kilogram. So 9.8, that's roughly 10. If you have a mass of 80 kilograms, 80 kilograms times about 10 newtons per kilogram means a force of 800 newtons. Well, here we're not talking about mass. Mass is not the property that causes matter to experience an electric force, it's electric charge. So if you know how many coulombs of charge something has, you multiply by the, the newtons per coulomb. The strength of the E field is specified in newtons per coulomb. Now, the, uh, the reason the force is opposite the electric field, see the electric fields point from right to left, but I've indicated that the force on the electrons points from left to right, that's because the charge of an electron is negative. So I've inserted negative E. We use the letter E uh, for its absolute value. That's the absolute value of the charge of a proton or an electron, the so-called fundamental unit of charge. But an electron is negatively charged. So force has the opposite direction for an electron compared to the electric field. Okay? And what does that mean? Well, even without, like I said, even without this voltage source, if there were no electric field between the cathodes, or excuse me, between the, uh, between the electrodes, you would still have electrons being ejected by the incoming light. They would still flow clockwise around the circuit. But if you then turn on this voltage source, and this really is at a higher potential than this, that would mean that your electric field would point from right to left, and the electrons would get an additional little push to the right. So perhaps they would be accelerated. They'd be going faster than they would otherwise. Now what happens if you switch the polarity? See down here, I've now indicated that the left side of the battery is at a higher potential than the, le uh, than the right side. So this is like going, going to the left now across the battery is like going uphill or uh, against the gravitational field. 
So this is like being high in the gravitational field. This is like being low in the gravitational field. Electric field points from high to low potential. So I've sw switched the polarity and I've switched the direction of the electric field. Again, because the force on an electron is opposite the E field, the force would now point that way. And this will be useful to us in the discussion of the photoelectric effect because once these electrons are ejected, they have to make it across the gap in order to rejoin the other electrode and continue flowing through the circuit. So if you've now established an electric field that's pushing opposite that motion, you could potentially stop those electrons before they get to the electrode. And that would allow you to, to measure some interesting things like how high would the voltage have to be before the electric field is strong enough to stop those charges. And if you could determine that, you could, you could figure out how fast those electrons are moving. And that might tell you something about how much energy they have. Well, where did they get the energy? They got it from the incoming light. So by making measurements of current and voltage, we can deduce some things about the nature of the incoming light. Okay, now, this may confuse you. Just a moment ago, I switched back and forth between negative, positive, et cetera. Uh, it's typical to see how this little line is longer than this line. It's typical to label this the plus side of your voltage source, and this is the minus sign. But oftentimes, uh, this side of the battery or the voltage source could actually be at a lower potential. So delta V in the following diagrams and in your book, delta V means this potential on the right side minus this potential on the left side. So if your voltage, delta V, which that's change in potential between two places, we call that voltage. If your voltage is negative, that actually means that the right side is at a lower potential than the left side, which would correspond to this picture here. But I'm not gonna use this picture anymore. I'm just always gonna leave it plus and minus on the right and the left. And it's understood that if the voltage we're talking about is negative, then this side of the battery is actually at a lower potential than the left side. I hope that doesn't confuse you, but that's fairly typical in a lot of circuit diagrams. Okay, so just now I've indicated, what if the, the potential difference or voltage is negative so that this is at a lower potential than this? Then this would be like the uphill side of the battery. This is the downhill side. So the electric field would point from left to right. And again, that means the charges, since they're negative, will be pushed to the left. Okay, before looking at this, uh, this graph and the subsequent graphs, let's take a look at the simulation from the FET website. We were supposed to do this lab in a laboratory setting. It's an awesome lab measuring, using the photoelectric effect to measure Planck's constant. But this will have to suffice. So they've got their variable voltage source. Notice I can move the slider right and left. Right now, uh, delta V is a positive number, which means this really is at a higher potential than that. If I move the slider to the left, okay, so what they've done is actually indicate that the, they're using the button side of, the, of this battery to indicate that this is the high potential end. That's a little, that's different than what I had just described in the, uh, in the slideshow, but it's actually probably better. Okay, so wherever, wherever they put the button, that's the high potential side of the battery. And right now, that would mean that the electric field points from here to there, from left to right, which means the force on the electrons would be from right to left. Okay, uh, presently, uh, the intensity of this light is set at arbitrarily. It's set at 48%. Let me put this down to zero. And let's illuminate this first with uh, violet light. Okay, notice there are no electrons being ejected. There is no emission of electrons due to the, the photo, or you could call them photoelectron, excuse me, photoelectrons, plural. A photoelectron is an electron that's been ejected by incoming light. Okay, so I'm going to gradually increase the intensity and we'll see what happens. Whoa. So there are a few electrons that are being bumped out of the, the electrode, but then they just go right back down almost as if they're given some energy and then the energy is taken away. And that's because I have this uh, battery set so that the electrons are being pushed to the left. Let me put the voltage back down to zero. I think I can enter a number here. Let's do that. Yeah, check it out. So you don't even need a battery. You could just take the battery out, close the circuit with a piece of wire, literally a piece of wire, and you would still have a current flowing in the circuit. So are they showing the current here? Yeah, it's not very large, but this red dot, the vertical coordinate, is the current. What happens if I turn up the light intensity? 
aha, see how the current is creeping up? And that is because there is more charge per second striking the opposite electrode. Not surprising, you've got more energy coming in. We know that intensity corresponds to power, power per square centimeter or square meter. So we would expect a greater intensity to liberate more electrons from the electrode, or if you want to call it the cathode. Okay, so I've got the intensity all the way up at 100%. Let me just put it down to 50, roughly. And I will gradually uh, change the color here. So right now we're at uh, violet light. Let's go towards longer wavelengths and see what happens. Can we zoom in on the current here? Yeah, interesting. So, so now that I've zoomed in the, the scale of the vertical axis, I see that when I, when I lower the, or when, excuse me, when I extend the wavelength, I actually have less current flowing. What's up with that? Hmm. Oh, you can also read it down here. I see they're giving us the current directly. Even though I haven't changed the intensity, that's kind of odd, is it? And look at that. Now that I've gotten into the green part of the spectrum, the current has just ceased altogether. There are no electrons being ejected. Classically, we would think, okay, well, I'm not really sure why the color would affect that, but at the very least, I should just be able to make the lamp brighter because in the 1800s, late 1800s, everybody was convinced because of Maxwell's synthesis of the various equations of electricity and magnetism, everybody was convinced that uh, light consists of electromagnetic waves and we know that waves can deliver energy continuously to a surface. Just think of waves at the beach. They're, they're bringing energy into the shore constantly. Same with uh, waves on a string. As you shake the string up and down, the power flowing through that wave is continuous. So how come we can't just turn up the, the intensity here, right? Remember, intensity has to do with the amplitude of the oscillations. Even at full brightness, nothing. If I go down to uh, red light, definitely. I'm gonna go back to green light though here. And, whoa, I went a little too far. Okay, so these will make their way eventually. Let's try switching the metal. So this simulation gives us control over the, the uh, material from which the electrode is made. Let's try a different one, zinc. Nothing, no photo emission with uh, a zinc electrode. Copper, anything? Oh, look, they're even changing the color for us. That's nice. Still nothing. Platinum. Mm, okay. Calcium? Okay, that kind of surprises me. I thought one of these would work at least. Let me go back into the green part of the spectrum. So for calcium, nothing. For platinum, nothing. Copper, nothing. Well, what I was trying to demonstrate is that the, uh, the threshold wavelength, you're, you're noticing that there's a particular crossover point on the spectrum at which the wavelength is short enough for whatever reason that, that uh, electrons are ejected. And I was hoping to show that that threshold wavelength depends on the metal. So let me, let me put it right at the boundary between ejecting and not ejecting electrons. It was somewhere in the green part of the spectrum. Okay, so right around 500 nanometers is the crossover point. Now let me try switching to different photoelectrodes, or excuse me, different electrode materials. Okay, good, this is the effect I was looking for. 505 nanometers evidently is not capable of producing the photoelectric effect if the electrode is made of zinc. However, if it's made of sodium, it does exhibit the photoelectric effect. Okay, so the effect depends on the material. Now, if I go back to zinc, green light doesn't work, but this purple light, no. Aha, we have, we have to go clear into the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. So there's something about zinc that requires uh, a considerably shorter wavelength of light in order to demonstrate or in order to exhibit the photoelectric effect. Okay, now let's, um, let's do the following. I'll go back to sodium. Let's pick a wavelength that works. 
And you can see that these electrons have a, an overall average kinetic energy that you can observe by looking at their speed. So what happens if we now turn on the voltage source? Let's see if the current goes up at all. It didn't. I'm looking at the graph over here, and I'm also observing this number. When I turn up the voltage, you can see an obvious effect on the electrons. It's like they get sucked over to the other side. Again, that's because the electric field points from right to left. So there's a force on the electrons from left to right. They give a little boost, but it doesn't actually increase the current. Why is that? Current, by definition, is the number of charges per second flowing through or flowing past a given point in the circuit. So however many, however much charge is striking this plate per second, that's the same amount of charge flowing right through this current meter. And that cannot be increased by turning up this voltage. All it does is make these crash harder into the opposite electrode. It doesn't actually increase their numbers per unit time because what controls the number of electrons striking the plate per unit time? That would be the light source. So if I turn the intensity down, now fewer electrons are emitted. That means fewer electrons per second are striking the plate and the current does drop. Okay, so by turning the current up, or excuse me, by turning the voltage uh, towards positive values, we don't actually increase the current. What happens if we make the, the uh, voltage negative? Let me put the intensity all the way back up at 100%. And this time, I will put the, the voltage so that it's slightly negative. And you can see that these charges, whoa, not, are, not only are they being slowed down, they stop and turn around. None of them make it to the other side. Interesting. So this is called the stopping potential. And I probably overshot a little bit, but the stopping potential is the potential at which the current completely ceases. So let me try typing in values manually here. How about negative half a volt? Okay, now they're making it a little bit farther. Aha, they're still not making it to the other side. So even half a volt negative is more than sufficient. Let's try 0.3. Voltage must be numeric, okay. Okay, now they make it to the other side. But you'll notice that some of them are turned back. That's interesting. Some of them make it, some of them turn back. Or do they all make it? I thought I saw some of them turning back. Anyway, I think if we, let's turn this up just a little bit so that more of them stop. How about negative 0.35? Let's see what happens there. They're all still making it. I'm looking for a potential where some of them make it and some of them don't. Getting close, right? Let me try 0.45. If you're bored here, just skip ahead a couple minutes in the video here. If there is a point to this. You see, what I'm exploring about the simulation here is whether all of the charges are ejected with the same speed. I'm assuming that the simulation is giving these charges a range of speeds so that some come out fast enough to make it to the other side and others don't. That's what I was hoping that the simulation would show us. No, but they all seem to be making it. Okay, so I'm going to move on from that. But we'll look at a graph of current versus stopping potential. Now check this out. Um, observe how slowly they're going. What happens if I now move towards a shorter wavelength? I'll go all the way into the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Do you see now how fast each of these is ejected? Now this is giving us more information than the original researchers had. They didn't have a little silly Java simulation to show them a, a cartoon picture of how quickly the electrons are moving. They would have had to infer that, but we can see here very easily that at shorter wavelength, like, excuse me, wavelengths, the charges get ejected more quickly. Now check this out. What if I go to a low intensity? So there's very dim light illuminating the electrode. And yet 
I think if we wait long enough, yep, there it is. The electrons still get ejected occasionally and they still come out really fast. I'm waiting for another one. Huh. There it is. Conversely, let me go back down to green. Green still works, but this time I'll turn the intensity way up. Okay, so now I've got far more charges being ejected per unit time, but they're not coming out as fast. Okay, so all of these facts seem to defy a classical explanation, especially, let's see here, let me turn, put the stopping potential back to zero, especially this fact, the fact that, um, I'm waiting for this to clear, the fact that red light is completely incapable of, a, of producing photoelectrons in a sodium cathode, even when it's really bright. I've got the intensity all the way up at 100%. Nothing is happening. No electrons are being ejected. And yet, if I go down to very dim light and a low wavelength corresponding to high frequency, I immediately get photoelectrons. That defies classical explanation because uh, you would assume, in fact, your book, your book has a really nice discussion of this. They talk about the temperature inside the metal and the fact that you would expect the electrons within the cathode to be zipping around faster within the metal as you raise the temperature of the cathode. So it, to a, a classical sensibility around the year 1900, you would expect that no matter what the wavelength of your light is, if you shine a bright enough light on this cathode, you should begin to make the cathode very warm. And that means the electrons within the cathode are going faster. Eventually, they should be able to go fast enough that they get ejected from the cathode. So two very important, important points there. Number one, no matter what the, the wavelength of the light, if the light is bright enough, you should be able to heat up the cathode sufficiently to give the electrons enough energy that they jump out of the metal. And also, there would be a time delay. You would expect a time delay. If the light is very low intensity, you've got very little wattage coming in per square, square centimeter, you would expect uh, some time to be necessary to, to accumulate enough energy so that the, uh, the cathode warms sufficiently. And yet, can I reset this? And yet, if I put the, uh, the light all the way out, all the way down at like 1%, can I do that? Let me type in the number one. Okay, so it's extremely dim light, but I'll give it uh, low wavelength. And as soon as I hit play, nope, I was expecting to see an electron ejected immediately. Maybe that's the intensity is too low. Okay, so this effect is not pronounced enough, but your book discusses the fact that yeah, so there's a disconnect here between the animation and the current. You see how they're showing us there is a current, but we don't see any electrons. The current's down here at 0 0.063, but they're not animating any electrons. That's a little unfortunate about the simulation because experimentally, even if the light is extremely dim, dim, as soon as you turn it on, there's current, which is a little surprising because if the current's really, excuse me, if the light is really dim, it's extremely low wattage, you would expect that it would take some time to warm up the cathode sufficiently to get the temperature high enough so that the electrons are moving around fast enough that they can jump away. Okay, so let's get back to the slides and talk about all these observations. I think we can understand everything about this graph now. Uh, now this graph assumes a single wavelength of light is used. There's no, there's no difference in the wavelength used for these two curves. But when, you're, when your applied voltage is zero, so you're not giving them a push in either direction, uh, we see that for more intense light, we get more current. You saw that in the simulation. The more, uh, the more wattage per square centimeter you shine on that cathode, the more electrons get ejected per second, the more of them make it to the other side per second. Of course, the current's going to go up. So intense light does produce more current than weak light. And there's nothing surprising about that classically. However, uh, as, you, as you apply a positive voltage across the circuit, remember you saw the electrons speed up. They're getting a little boost in the direction that they're already moving. And when you do that, at first there's a, a small increase in the amount of current flowing through the circuit, but then there's no additional increase whatsoever. It doesn't matter how much of a boost you give them, 
there's there's no additional current. And I tried to point that out while I was looking at the simulation. When you turn up the voltage, all it does is make the electrons that are already in the gap move faster. They just crash into the opposite electrode faster. But you can't increase the number of charges flowing just by turning up the voltage because the light ultimately is the source of the number of charges liberated. Now, what is peculiar is this stopping potential. So as your book points out, V-stop is a positive number. We're talking uh, here about the potential difference, delta V. So the, the horizontal axis here is for delta V. Negative V stop is the negative of a positive number. So we are talking about a negative potential difference. Over here is when you've made the right side of the battery actually at a lower potential than the left side. And that would mean that the electrons are getting, they're getting pushed opposite the direction that they're ejected. In the simulation, they were being pushed towards the left. And if you turn that uh, negative potential up high enough, then the current stops altogether, hence the name V-stop. V-stop is the potential difference, or it's the absolute value of the potential difference at which the current ceases altogether. And you saw in the simulations, that's when all those electrons get slowed down so much that they never make it to the other side. In fact, they may even be reversed and zip right back to the cathode from whence they came. Now this is, this is probably the most surprising thing about the photoelectric effect. What is up with this threshold frequency? Remember, uh, what was it? I, I was exploring different wavelengths for sodium and I found that somewhere in the green spec part of the spectrum, you go to longer wavelengths than the middle of the green part of the spectrum and suddenly there's no current whatsoever. No electrons are ejected. That's the so-called threshold frequency. So. The simulation showed wavelength, but we know that long wavelengths correspond to uh, low frequency, right? High wavelength, high in number, is low frequency. So this region corresponds to the orange and red part of the spectrum, or infrared, and no current flows whatsoever. Here is where there was no emission of photoelectrons. So that, that's puzzling from a classical perspective. Again, in the 1800s or late 1800s, they thought that the electrons probably were zipping around within the metal at some characteristic speed, average speed determined by the temperature because that's what worked for the ideal gas law, right? Remember VRMS is like root three K T over M, something like that. And it shouldn't, you know, classically it shouldn't matter whether it's violet light or, or red light. If you hit the cathode with bright enough light, you should be able to warm the cathode up sufficiently to get the temperature high enough that the electrons are moving fast enough to be ejected. So it was very puzzling that, it, that the photoelectric effect was observed for some wavelengths and not others. Also the photoelectric, excuse me, the uh, threshold frequency is a function of the metal. It depends on which metal you're using. Okay, so here's a little, a uh, couple other graphics here. We don't really need these, do we? After having looked at the simulation, these pictures seem insufficient. Okay, but you can take a look at those. Those are in your book. Okay, now it's time to talk about the so-called work function. It's kind of a hoity-toity name for a very basic idea, but this picture I've, I've made here is totally heuristic. Is that the word? Do not take it literally, but there is something in solid state theory. That's a subject I'm not very familiar with, but if that's a whole branch of physics. Solid state theory is is the physics of particles in crystals, elements. Uh, it's like a applied quantum mechanics and it's rather, rather advanced. But there are these things called energy bands. So within this, this piece of metal, the cathode, there's a whole bunch of different energy levels that can be occupied by the electrons within the metal. And I've, I've tried to show a whole bunch of those energy levels, but realistically, they're much more closely spaced and there are many more of them because the number of electrons is insane, right? Uh, even a, a palm-sized chunk of, you know, that's something you could fit, you could fit in your palm. A uh, piece of matter has got a mole, 10 moles of particles. So we're talking about 10 to the 24th or so electrons. There's gotta be a whole lot of different energy levels. Well, those energy levels are distributed over a range of values. So I've just put some dots here to represent the uh, various energy levels occupied by those electrons. And 
you, you could think of this as the surface of the metal, but don't think about that too literally because it's not like the electrons actually have varying depths. What they have is varying energy depths. So some of the electrons require more energy to be extracted from the metal than others. I mean, after all, that's what the light is doing, right? The light comes in, deposits electromagnetic energy, which is then used to eject electrons from the metal. So this is the one at the top that would require the least input of energy to be liberated from the, from the metal. So this is the least possible energy that could potentially eject an electron from the metal. If you want to eject this electron, you're going to need more energy. So it's just a symbolic picture. And there's a, a special name for that. It's called the work function. It's just a historical name. It's the minimum energy needed to extract an electron from a metal. And this is what depends on the particular metal. And there is a table in your book. So different metals have different work functions. And I think I'll pause and pull that table up. So here's a table of uh, work functions for various common metals. And the energies are all listed in electron volts. And I actually did not prepare slides for talking about the electron volt here, but it's, it's nothing more than a, a very convenient unit of energy when talking about things like packets of light energy or the energy of, a, of an electron zipping through the air. So when you get to um, atomic physics, it's, it's just a convenient unit. It's much smaller than the joule. Even the joule is a rather small amount of energy by human standards, right? Like we use the food calorie to talk about our energy intake per day. We eat, you know, 3,000 calories a day maybe if you're, if you're somewhat active. Well, you, in joules, you eat something like, uh, I don't know, 10 or 20 million joules every day. So that's not the most convenient unit of energy for, for purposes of dieting, let's say. Uh, in terms of electron volts, uh, let's see, you, you probably eat like a trillion, trillion electron volts worth of energy every day. So it's not a convenient unit for talking about burning calories at the gym, but it, it is convenient for uh, atomic physics. So very simply, let me get the laser pointer. An electron volt is the kinetic energy acquired by an electron if it's accelerated between two metal plates that have a voltage across them of one volt. That's it. If you, had, if you took a one and a half volt battery and hooked the terminals up to two metal plates and allowed an electron to get ejected between the plates, it would acquire one electron volt of kinetic energy. It's a very small unit of energy. So I'll probably take more time to talk about that later. Just for comparison, uh, remember the joule is the amount of work you do if you apply a force of one newton, that's like a quarter pound, through one meter, which is about three feet. So lift, lift a quarter pound burger through three feet. You just did one joule of work. That's not very much work. Well, uh, a common energy unit in physics used to be the ERG, E-R-G. I think it was short for ergon, ergon. And um, that was the, the energy equivalent to applying a force of one dyne through a centimeter, D-Y-N-E, dyne instead of Newton. It's an old unit that doesn't get used much anymore, but a dyne is a gram centimeter per second squared instead of a kilogram meter per second squared. In any case, uh, an erg of energy is about the energy uh, output of a little house fly doing a push-up. If you've ever watched flies close up, sometimes they look like they're doing push-ups. Every one of those push-ups requires about one erg of energy. I'm just making the point that we choose a unit that's convenient. And from now on, we'll be talking about electron volts or EV. Okay, so let's look at this picture here. The, uh, the incoming light deposits energy in some way into these electrons. And remember, it takes a certain amount of energy to extract them from the metal. And uh, the idea is that the incoming light has enough, well, if you observe the photoelectric effect, it's got enough energy to do that. And there may even be leftover energy. So I've kind of put the cart before the horse here. I didn't have the picture up of Einstein, but Einstein is, is the one who made this uh, rather bold suggestion that the light brought in, or excuse me, that the energy brought in by the light is absorbed all or nothing. It's absorbed, it's absorbed one packet at a time uh, in discrete little units 
that at the time were called quanta. Now we call them photons. But remember, this should be familiar from uh, the video that I just posted about Planck's correction to the radiation curves for a black body radiation. Planck was the one that, that uh, imagined that those standing electromagnetic waves within the, within the uh, black body radiator, that they could only have um, certain values of energy. It was like a ladder of energy levels. And the spacing was uh, proportional to the frequency with constant of proportionality H. Okay, so those, you just imagine those modes, the standing uh, electromagnetic waves within the cavity, they can only take energy of one, two, three. I'm, I'm making an, an arbitrary spacing here. Um, and the natural interpretation in retrospect is that those modes, those standing waves, are really just a collection of uh, photons, packets of light bouncing around within the cavity. And you can either add a photon to a particular mode, meaning a particular frequency, or you can subtract a photon. That's it. So every time you add a pho photon to that mode, you've increased the energy of that mode by some specific amount, and that amount would be HF. So Einstein was the one that suggested maybe the energy coming in from the light is, is in these little packets, these little quanta of energy that get absorbed all or nothing. And they, they get absorbed, absorbed all at once also. So that would explain why uh, even in the very dim light, the current turns on immediately. So if you're using ultraviolet light, uh, but low intensity, despite the fact that it's low intensity, as soon as you turn on the light, you've already got electrons ejected because the light comes in at little packets or in little packets and it's, it's absorbed almost immediately. Okay, but the idea I'm expressing here is uh, each packet of light comes in with a certain amount of energy, HF, some of that energy is used to remove the electron from the metal, and whatever's left over is kinetic energy. So that's what I've said here. The kinetic energy of any particular photoelectron, that's an electron that's been ejected, is the energy given to it or endowed to it with, or by the photon, by an incoming photon, minus whatever it took to get it out of the metal. Everything left over is kinetic energy. Now, uh, presumably, if the light is just one frequency, every packet coming in has the same energy. So which of these electrons, suppose they're all ejected, which one's going to have the most kinetic energy left over? Well, this one at the top required, excuse me, it required the least amount of energy to be ejected. So it will have the most energy left over. So I can take this equation and modify it and say uh, the maximum kinetic energy of any particles coming out would be the energy endowed to them by the, uh, by the incoming packets of light minus that minimum energy, in other words, the work function. So this is a really important equation to understand for the photoelectric effect. Each packet of light brings in uh, an amount of energy, HF. Some of it, E0, that's the work function, is used to extract the electrons from the metal. But it, it is important to understand some of the electrons require even more energy than that to be extracted. So there's less energy left over from this incoming packet. And that is why I hope the simulation showed this. Of all the electrons being ejected from the electrodes, some were moving faster than others. The ones that were moving the fastest, the ones that had the maximum kinetic energy, were the ones that were, you know, this is symbolic, but the ones that were at the top of the energy band here and required only an amount of energy called the work function to remove them. Okay, now we'll have to go back and talk about potential energy here. I'm hoping most of you remember this from 3B, the formula for potential energy. But just to help those of you who haven't or if you've forgotten, think back to 3A. I think everybody remembers the formula for gravitational potential energy, MGH, or let's say MGY. In, in 3A, we're always talking about energy in joules. We take an object's mass, we multiply by the G field and the height through which it was raised, and we get a quantity in joules, that's energy. But in, uh, in 3B, we're often talking about the energy per mass, where really it's the energy per charge. That's what potential is, it's confusing. So there's potential energy, for which we use the letter U, and then there's potential, for which we use the letter V. Potential is the potential energy per unit charge. So just like in, in 3A, when you take, you take the mass and you multiply by GH, M times 
GH. So GH is like the potential energy per mass, then you multiply by the mass. That's how you can think of this. V is the potential energy per charge, Q is the charge. And remember, you always have to pick where your reference potential is. When you're talking about gravitational energy, if we're in the classroom on the third floor, we just say that the floor of that classroom is where the potential energy is zero. If you drop, if you drop a brick onto the floor, it now has zero potential energy. Well, somebody outside the building would say, actually, the ground floor would be a better choice of, of zero for potential energy. So it's totally up to you. And what they've done in this diagram is to say that over here at the cathode, where the electrons get ejected, that's where we're going to say that their potential energy is zero. So the potential energy over here is always going to be defined with respect to the cathode. Okay, so the potential, not potential energy, but the potential here would be delta V, because remember, delta V means V here minus V there. But since the V here is zero, then delta V is just equal to the V here. Does that make sense? Like, what if this is a zero and this is seven? What's the delta V? Well, seven minus zero, which is still seven. That's why the potential here is the same as the difference in potential because the value over here is zero. All right, your book could have um, perhaps presented this a little more clearly, but I'm doing it the way they've done it. All of this is to say that the, the potential energy that the charge has when it's over here is equal to its, its uh, charge in Coulombs times delta V, the potential difference between the two. Again, it's just like when you allow a mass to fall through a gravitational field and it loses or gains potential energy depending on the direction of the field. That's what we've got here, except now it's an electric field and it's a, an electric charge moving through the field. So it's either gaining or losing potential energy. Here is where they've substituted. The charge of an electron is negative E. Remember, E is a positive number, but an electron has negative charge. And now we just make the simple statement of energy conservation. Because as the electrons are accelerated between the electrodes, since it's a, a vacuum, since they've sucked out all the air, the electrons should not be crashing into any air particles or experiencing friction. There shouldn't be any loss of, of uh, energy here. So energy on the left side equals energy on the right side. I'm calling that initial and final. This is not F for frequency. This is F for final. Okay, now, can we cross any of these out? Remember, in the initial picture, um, uh, we're calling the potential energy here zero. So I can get rid of U initial. That, that will just be zero. Oh, and you know, I made a mistake here. Let me fix that. Okay, once again, I'm beginning with the statement of energy conservation. And because I've substituted K max for K initial, that means that I'm applying this thought process specifically to the electrons that are, uh, that are taken from that top part of the energy band, the electrons that required the least amount of energy to be extracted. In other words, the electrons that only required an amount of energy called the work function to be extracted. Those are the ones that come out with the maximum possible kinetic energy. Okay. And since of my, since my choice of, of zero for potential energy put the left side or the left electrode at zero, and I've plugged that in here. And what I'm interested in is uh, the kinetic energy that they have when they get to the other side after moving through the applied potential delta V. And now let's make the further evaluation. Let's look specifically at the stopping potential. So you've turned the voltage negative. And with a great enough magnitude that, that even those fastest moving electrons don't make it to the other side. Basically, you've turned up the electric field high enough so that the force is just enough to stop the, the particles right before they, or stop the electrons right before they get to the other side. So that this is right when the current has gone to zero. Remember one of the graphs from your book, those two blue curves for the two different intensities. This is on the, uh, the left side of the vertical axis where the current goes to zero at the so-called stopping potential. So let me um, evaluate this equation at that place. The kinetic energy final has just gone to zero. So I've plugged in zero for the final kinetic energy. And the change in potential specifically is, or the, the voltage between them, delta V is negative V stop. Remember V stop is the absolute value of the potential difference 
And since I know it's negative, I have to insert the minus sign. Okay, so let's uh, rewrite that equation. And it's very simple. It says the stopping potential is the one just large enough to take away all the kinetic energy of the fastest moving electrons. And that's going to be useful to us. So try to memorize this for the next five to 10 minutes because it's going to show up in a moment. And I'll return to this equation. Uh, each quantum of light, which we now call photon, brings in an energy HF. Obviously, it depends on the frequency and hence, hence the wavelength. Uh, some of that energy was required to extract the electron um, from the metal. And again, we're talking about only those electrons at the top of the energy band. Anything left over is kinetic energy. And I'm calling that Kmax because once again, we're talking about the, the most easily extracted electrons at the top of the energy band. Okay, so look, we've got two expressions for Kmax. We, we can experimentally determine Kmax in the lab because it's really easy to use a voltmeter and just you know keep fiddling with the voltage until you find that the current goes to zero. This is a lab we would have done in class. It's very simple. Uh, measuring voltages and currents, those were things that were being done well before the year 1900 with you know pretty good lab equipment. So let's take this expression for Kmax, plug it in here, and we wind up with this equation. So this is a relation between a volt, a stopping voltage, which is easily measured in a lab. Also, um, the frequency can be determined via spectroscopy. Think back to wave optics. When we talked about diffraction, I demonstrated the use of diffraction gratings in class. You can shine coherent light, in our case it was a laser beam, shine coherent light through a bunch of slits, like a diffraction grating, and you can use the spacing of those bright interference fringes to measure the wavelength. If you recall, you did that. You actually measured the wavelength of laser light. So frequency can be measured pretty accurately in a laboratory, even in the year 1900, and so can stopping potential. And this value was already known. Remember uh, Rutherford and Millikan, no, J.J. Thompson, that's who it was. J.J. Uh, Thompson and, Ruth and Millikan, between the two of them, their efforts, you know, and of course all the help they had in the lab, uh, gave us the, the charge on the electron. That's a really interesting thing to read about in chapter 37. So all this garbage was known, and that means perhaps H could be measured. You can use this effect, this photoelectric effect, to cross-check the value of Planck's constant. Because remember, Planck himself determined the value of H by, by fitting the experimental data for black body radiators to his theoretical curve. Okay, so I've rewritten the equation. And now let's divide the whole equation by the electron charge to write it like this, and voila. Um, what you could do is illuminate, and you know what, I think I've, I've left something out here, didn't I? Yeah, this is supposed to say F threshold? No, hang on a second. This equation's correct, so uh, no mistake here. You can illuminate the, the um, cathode, let's say it's a sodium cathode, illuminate it with light of different frequencies and measure the corresponding stopping potentials. Because remember, if you hit it with a light of a shorter wavelength and hence higher frequency, then each incoming quantum of light carries in more energy. And that means there's more leftover kinetic energy after the electrons have been ejected. And that means you're gonna have to turn the stopping potential up even higher in the negative direction before the current ceases. So stopping potential is a function of the incoming light frequency. What type of function? Well, it's staring us in the face. It's a linear relation. This is like Y equals MX plus B. So for a particular type of cathode material, which has a particular work function, all we have to do is illuminate the cathode with various uh, different wavelengths and make a table of the stopping potentials, plot those on a graph, and the slope of that graph should be H over E, and the intercept should be the stopping potential. Beautiful. Now let's, let's go one step further and evaluate this equation at the threshold frequency. Remember, when I looked at the simulation for sodium, for instance, violent light, violent, <laughs> violet, violet and blue light were capable of ejecting electrons, but red light was not. So that crossover frequency, that's called the threshold frequency. And 
think about it. If, if your frequency of light is just enough to eject electrons, aren't they going to be ejected with no leftover kinetic energy? Like they'll, they'll be freed from the metal, but they're not going to go anywhere. They'll just be chilling in the space next to the cathode. In which case, you don't have to apply any backwards potential to stop them from reaching the other side. So if you're illuminating the cathode at the threshold frequency, which I'll call F0, then the stopping potential required is zero volts. They're not going to be ejected with any leftover kinetic energy. Hence, there's no need to push back on them with a, a negative applied potential. So at the threshold frequency, K max is zero, and that means V stop is zero. Remember this equation right here? If the max kinetic energy of the ejected electrons is zero, then so is the stopping potential. Okay, so let's, let's plug that in. If you plug in zero for stopping potential and F naught for the threshold frequency, then you can just move the E naught over here. And we see that the stopping potential is merely this quantity. So I'm going to rewrite the stopping potential in terms of this. Whoa, hey there. This is your instructor interrupting now from the future. Well, maybe not the future, but the less distant past, because I made this video originally in spring of 2020, but then I realized later in the year that there were some mistakes in that video. So now I'm here in spring 2021 to correct just a couple things. Namely, in this equation here, I originally, let me get the laser pointer. When I divided this, this equation by the charge of the electron, I forgot to distribute the division to the um, work function here. Also, at some point I misspoke a few seconds or minutes ago, and I called this quantity the stopping potential. No, 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 no. E naught is the work function. It's the amount of energy required just to extract an electron from the metal. It depends which metal you're talking about. It's usually a few E volts. So the equation really should look like this. And that means down here when I rearrange or when I plug in zero for the stopping potential, um, I also need to have the E in the denominator there. And when I solve this for the, uh, the work function E naught, I would get this. Okay. So remember at this point in the presentation, we're, we're looking at the specific case of a color of light, or I should say a wavelength of light, where the photons have just barely enough energy to liberate the electrons. Um, in other words, the incoming energy of the photon is equal to the work function of that particular material or metal. So there's no energy left over. Um, the, the max possible kinetic energy that an electron could have after being liberated from the metal is zero. And that is the case for which the stopping potential is zero. That's how I got this bottom equation to begin with, right? Let me back up a couple slides. You can see right here, I evaluated the stopping potential or I plugged in the value zero for V stop. Now we can equate the, uh, the work function with the energy of a photon that has the uh, threshold frequency. An incoming photon with this frequency, F0, has an energy equal to the work function. So up here now, I can substitute HF0 for the work function, which I've done here. Here's the part where we factor out H over E. And I will revert back now to the 2020 video. And now what we can do is factor out the H over E. Okay. This is just another way of writing the equation of the line. By factoring out the slope, uh, we've rewritten uh, that intercept in terms of the threshold frequency rather than the stopping potential. And this would uh, make it easier to visualize the graph, I suppose. So I just stole a graph from your book. Here it is. This is supposed to be the theoretical curve. That's the line. And these dots represent actual data that you may have taken in a lab. So the idea is, let's say we've got six different data points here. That means you would have illuminated your, your cathode, one particular cathode. You're not swapping out different cathodes. 
different cathodes would have a different slope. So this is same cathode, but different wavelengths of light. Maybe you hit the cathode with red light, orange light, et cetera. And in each case, you uh, determine the stopping potential necessary. You could see down here, higher frequency photons require higher stopping potentials because they bring in more energy, they eject the photons with greater leftover kinetic energy, and that means you have to apply a, a greater voltage to bring them to a stop and cease the current. Okay, when, when you look at, uh, here are two different versions of that equation. When you look at it this way, it's easy to see that the stopping potential goes to zero when the frequency of applied light is the threshold frequency, right? Because F naught minus F naught is zero. So if we look at the F axis here, when F takes on the value not of 10, because at, at 10 times 10 to the 14th, we've got a stopping potential of what? Two and a half volts. But when you're stopping, excuse me, when your incoming light frequency equals the threshold frequency here, somewhere between four and six, the stopping potential is zero. Okay, you can see that right here. When F is evaluated at F naught, you've got F naught minus F naught, that's zero, stopping potential of zero. Just different ways of thinking about this equation of a line. Okay, but what we would have done in the lab is use this data to determine H because in Excel, you could have plopped in your table of stopping potentials versus applied light frequencies, ask Excel for a best fit line, just like the green line here, and then get the slope of that best fit line. So the slope here would be H over E. And you know, for this made up example here, they're telling us that, that the uh, software would have spit out a slope for the best fit line of 4.12 times 10 to the negative 15th. That's an extremely small number, but we're about to make it even smaller. Let's solve this for H. So multiply both sides by the electron charge. And that's what I've done here. So if you put E out front, this is the charge of an electron in coulombs. And for those of you who didn't take 3B, you've heard of amperage, right? When you, when you talk about how much electric current is flowing, you're talking about amps. Like a lot of circuit breakers in homes will trip at 15 amps. If you turn on your toaster and your blender and all this other stuff at the same time, you might be drawing 20 amps and the circuit breaker trips. Well, 20 amps just means that every second, 20 coulombs of charge flow past any given point in the wires, 20 coulombs of charge. And here we're, we're writing the fact that an electron was discovered to have a charge of less than a thousandth of a trillionth of a coulomb. What that tells us is the coulomb is a, is a rather large quantity of charge in comparison to an electron. Just take the reciprocal of this. There's basically 10 to the 19th electrons in one coulomb of charge. When they defined the coulomb back in the 1800s or 1700s, they had no idea what the charge carriers were. Okay, and this is the value that we get from this uh, contrived little experiment here. 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34th. Now I haven't written the units, but they are joule seconds. I'll get to that in a moment. Or no, that was in the previous video. So joule seconds. Try to remember that power of, of 10, because this shows up a lot. It's an extremely small number there. I suppose that's it. So you definitely want to be familiar with the concept here. It's not difficult, right? In fact, the most difficult thing about the photoelectric effect is putting yourself in the mindset of scientists around the year 1900 and trying to understand why it was so puzzling. So I really encourage you to go, you to go back through the chapter. They, they give a whole list of the, the things that didn't make sense about this effect if you're operating uh, with, within the framework of uh, classical physics. Make, make sure you read to that list about why it was confusing. Because once you know about light quanta, once you imagine that, that the light comes in these little packets of energy, the way Newton, ironically enough, the way Newton imagined it, these little corpuscles of light, there's really nothing surprising about the photoelectric effect. So the, the main takeaway here is that at least in this particular experiment, light exhibits a very particle-like behavior. The, the light appears to be absorbed in little packets and the, the absorption happens almost instantly. Remember, when you shine dim light on the cathode, you get ejected electrons almost immediately. The classical idea would suggest, well, since the light is dim, you're gonna have to shine it for a while before the temperature within the cathode gets high enough so that the electrons are moving fast enough that they can uh, be ejected from the cathode. 
But now it's a different picture. That They get ejected almost immediately, suggesting that the interaction between those photons, those packets of light, and the electrons themselves is almost immediate. Now, your, your book says that. It happens instantly. But your book is a little dated. Go online. Look this up. I'll see if I can find the link. Uh, physicists or res researchers are still exploring the photoelectric effect. And the last time I saw a headline about it, they had actually pinned down the time frame. You know what? I'm going to pause and see if I can pull, if I can pull up the uh, article here. So here's that headline that I mentioned. I'm sure you can find other articles, but researchers, researchers determined, this is just a couple years ago, the absolute duration of the photoelectric effect. So your book suggested that it's instantaneous. Well, I guess some people weren't satisfied with that answer. It is a little suspicious, right? How could something take zero time at all? And uh, you can read this at your leisure. I'm going to scroll down to the answer. The measurement shows that photoelectrons from tungsten can be generated in around 40 attoseconds. What the heck is an attosecond? Well, I know a picosecond is a trillionth of a second, and a femtosecond is a thousandth of a trillionth, or 10 to the negative 15th. So something even smaller than that, 10 to the negative 18th. How can people measure such small times? A lot of you guys have trouble getting to class on time within the nearest minute. Yeah, I had to bring that up. But here we've got some people measuring things on the scale of 10 to the negative 18th seconds. So I suppose that may as well be instantaneous, but I'm going to have to do some reading after this because I would love to know how you could possibly measure that. So let's not forget to uh, pay some uh, or give some homage here to the guy who sorted this all out. Remember, everybody was puzzled by the photoelectric effect because, uh, you know, a lot of times physicists or people in any field, I suppose, you learn a ton. You've been studying for years. You're like an expert in your field, but you're stuck in a particular way of thinking and you just can't find your way out of that box. And then somebody has to come along with a fresh perspective. Maybe it's somebody who has the benefit of youth or somebody who just is rather new to the field because here's a young Einstein. This was in 1905. I forget how old he was, but I think he was in his mid twenties and he didn't have any trouble at all recognizing that the photoelectric effect could be explained if, if we imagine that light comes in these little packets. And he was inspired by Planck's work on black body radiation. I don't think Einstein would have come to this explanation without being aware of what Planck had recently done. And this is back before the internet. Uh, there's, there's no Zoom conferences, so he would have had to read papers, probably wasn't even in the same country as Planck. I don't know how things got circulated back then, but it's, it's remarkable that ideas spread so quickly given the limitations on telecommunications there. But it was his suggestion. And a number of the things Einstein did in his career were really not particularly difficult mathematically. I mean, he did plenty that was mathematically dense. But look what we're doing here. It's just algebra. There's no calculus. You can explain this to a high school student. And yet nobody else had thought of it. So this was a major step towards uh, the birth of this, this new branch or this new revolution in physics, the quantum revolution. I, I'm reluctant to use that term because the word quantum has really been co-opted by purveyors of uh, bogus health products and fad diets and any number of other pieces of quackery on AM radio and daytime TV. So, you know, be suspicious when somebody's trying to sell you something using the word quantum, unless it's a quantum computer and it's IBM selling it to you. I guess that might be legitimate. But um, 1905 is when he wrote his paper on the photoelectric effect. That was the same year that he wrote his paper on the so-called Brownian motion. If you look at, if you, um, what is it, dust particles? If you look at the surface of water under a microscope, you can see the little particles jiggling around and he's the one that, that um, analyzed, mathematically analyzed that jiggling in terms of collisions with water particles, I believe it was. That was a famous paper, definitely more mathematical than the photoelectric effect. And then the third paper was his paper on special relativity, where he uh, made the case that, that uh, things shrink when they're moving quickly, that time goes more slowly for people in motion with respect to you than it does for you. How could one person do all that stuff in one year? They call that the year of miracles. I think it sounds cooler in German, but 
what was I doing at that age? It's shameful to even think about it compared to, uh, to that, but Hey, all we can do is be inspired, right? So get back to your homework. <laughs>